Panorama TV presents How They Do That, where we explore the world of professional photographers and share their techniques with you. Here's your host, Mark Wallace. Hi everybody, welcome to How'd They Do That? I'm Mark Wallace. Well today on the show we have somebody that I'm really looking forward to talking to. His name is Jared Pollan. Some of you might know him as Fro Knows Photo. He's from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He is a music photographer, a storyteller, and a really inspirational guy. Welcome to the show, Jared. Thanks for having me, Mark. I am very excited to talk to you today, and I really want to dive into something. Um, a lot of people know you as the guy that does the sniff tests and sort of funny, but you actually have a lot of depth to how you tell stories and uh, the reason you tell stories. So can we begin right off the bat talking about the story of your mother and how you shot that? Absolutely. Um, so some of the people know on my website through the story of the fro uh, what those images are all about. For those who don't, my mother was di diagnosed with cancer. She passed away, we'll start there. She passed away in 2008, uh, it's like four years ago. And I found myself in an interesting predicament. As a photographer, I tell stories you know, I'd like to capture the moments, tell photo stories, and she was admitted to the hospital. We didn't know what was going on, and I actually just got my D3 at the time, and I took it with me, ignored all HIPAA rules and laws, and ignored the nurses telling me, no, you can't take pictures, and just told the story of what was going on. And that was the night my mother was diagnosed with cancer, and then she, you know, she passed away eight months later, and at that point, I started taking pictures to tell the story because you have to tell stories no matter what, whether they're good, bad, or other, you, you can't shy away, you have to tell the story. And later on I realized that I was pretty much hiding behind the camera, trying to not show emotion by, by capturing pictures and using the camera as a way to, to shield me from emotion, which wasn't the best thing, but it is what it is. I understand what I was doing then. Uh, but basically I followed everything that she did for the rest of her life basically and uh, captured those moments in, in photos and it, and it tells a really really touching and emotional story. It, it is touching and emotional and um, you know there's there's really not words to describe how brave I think these these photos are and you really document this and my father also was diagnosed with cancer he's still with us but um, he's a survivor. I've been through some of what you've been through and I wasn't able to do what you did. Um, I wasn't able to do that. So how, I know you talked a little bit about hiding behind the camera, but um, how did you find the courage to stick with it? And did your mother share her thoughts with you as you were shooting uh, these days of her life? That's, that's a great question. She at first wasn't sure that she wanted me to take pictures. Uh, she actually told me no at first to certain things, and then I would just, I'd, I'd say, look, we, we have to show the bad with the good. You have to tell these stories, and other people have to see them. Uh, she also realized that it was my way of dealing with the situation and, and trying to be you know, strong amidst what was going on, and she understood it, and then she came to accept it. Uh, I don't know if I, I don't even remember if I showed her any of these pictures. I don't think I ever did, but I, you know, I printed a book. I have a, actually an Adorama Pix book that sits on the desk. Uh, it's the black book because it's a black cover with a black back. And anybody that looks at that is going to get the story from start to the, to the finish of what I created there. Um, it's, it's just, it's something that I look back on and no matter how many times I look back and no matter how many years pass, it just, the, the emotion comes right back to that situation where, where she's sitting there in the kitchen and that was two weeks before she passed away and she just couldn't get warm. She was cold and you know, I've got those wide pictures that, that show the bottles in it. You've got the black and whites. Then you've got just some of the colors of her just sitting there and it's just cold. She's cold and just, it was taking a toll and it was almost near the end and it just, those are tough images to go back and look at. And it's just, you know, it, it's one of those tough things, but I, I hope that, you know, I put that video, I put up a video on YouTube, the story behind the fro, where I'm actually a year after she passed away, sitting at the gravestone, telling the story of everything. And then I replay this audio that I played based off of a James Blunt song that 
uh, carry you home and I'm pretty much breaking down throughout the whole audio telling the story of what's going on but I think I, I was hesitant to put that video up on YouTube and let people comment on it because I didn't know how they would react but what I what I realized was I had hundreds and hundreds of comments on that video and they still come in every single day that you know thank you for for showing emotion and saying that it's okay to cry and it's okay to to just express yourself and not hide everything away and that's what I think that this, these images allowed me to do is say it's okay to have emotion it's okay to cry it's okay to do all this stuff and share it with everybody because too many people hide all of these feelings and emotions away and it's and you really just need to you know, show it to everybody and the community comes together and there's help and people are there to, to, to help you out and you're not the only one who's ever gone through this situation so it's just a way of, of sharing with the rest of the world. Well I think that is a point that is very valid and that is that the photography isn't something that happens necessarily between a photographer and a subject. There, you know your family's involved in these photos, the people on YouTube are involved in these photos and um, I know because we've talked in the past that this experience actually inspired some other things that you're doing now. So can, can you tell us how this inspired some, some of the things that we, uh, we know you for now? Sure. Uh, you know, I have froknowsphoto.com or froknowsphoto.com and part of the reason for starting it is my mother, she was a teacher and she really loved helping kids become just better people and she she was a Montessori teacher and that's a very hands-on environment and she used to say I was her tougher toughest student she couldn't really get through to me I kind of fought everything that she would try to do which is just I don't know something that I did but you know I didn't start the site for almost two years after she passed away and you know one of the main reasons is to help people become better photographers to continue teaching and educating because if you stop learning uh, you're pretty much done, you know? And I felt that I had something to say, something that I could add to the conversation, add to the community to help people become better photographers. And my motto that I started was create fun and informative content which will help people learn more. And that's pretty much what she did with Montessori teaching. Montessori is meant to be fun and learn while you're having fun. And it's just, they go hand in hand. So. That's one of the main reasons for starting it, is that I had a lot to offer and she was a great teacher and I can continue to do the same thing and, and touch other people. Actually, if you want to go back to one of the main reasons and one of the biggest regrets that I ever had, and that was not giving my mom enough time uh, to teach her photography. She had the eye, she was the photographer of the family and, and she, she could capture those moments. And as we moved, I, I got her a film camera and I taught her that, but I never took the time to really fully teach her how to use a digital SLR. Um, and that's something that I, I regret not being able to do or not doing. It's not that I wasn't able to, I didn't do it. And you know, you have to deal with that. And one way to deal with that is to help as many people as possible that I can, even though I'll never get the chance to help her. I've helped thousands of people around the world become better photographers. Well, you have, and not only do you do it, you do it in a really fun and uh, entertaining way. And uh, one of the things that you do, help me understand it, it's called the sniff test. What is that about? The sniff test is just something that happened. I, I just remember being a kid and just sniffing baseball cards, toys, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Skull Mountain, He-Man, whatever. I, I don't know, I associate things with smell. So if I smell something, I smell, I say it smells like the color purple. And people sit there and go, well, what the hell does color purple smell like? And it's just like, I don't know. So it, it's just weird stuff. It's just, it, and then it took on its own life when I would unbox uh, new, new gear. I'd sit there and I'd go, wow, that reminds me of something. And then I'd try to put my finger on it. And, and for example, a 24-1-4 Nikon uh, lens, I was like, it smells like a red laser because lasers are sharp, just don't try to sniff a laser because you'll poke a hole in your nose. Uh, I don't know, it, it's just something that, that I did and I guess what happens on YouTube is weird works. So when you do something that's weird, people buy into it, so I continue to go ahead and do sniff tests. 
What's the best smelling photo gear that you've ever sniffed? The best smelling photo gear I've ever sniffed? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, mm, trying to pinpoint what I've unboxed that's just, okay, a, a Nikon 200 millimeter F2. That thing just smells like a million bucks. It's just, it's just awesome. Uh, one, it's an amazing lens, sharp, fast, and really expensive, but it, it smelled wonderful. That is awesome. Well, um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about your gear. And before we do that, let's talk about what you shoot because you, you shoot, uh, not only do you tell stories, but you also shoot um, music, a lot of uh, uh, bands and things like that. You're at South by Southwest, all that stuff. Tell us about your music photography. Yeah, so music photography was something that, that didn't hit me until I was about 20 and I was in college and Almost Famous came out. And that movie set me on the path to basically photograph, want to travel on the road with bands because bands are interesting, they go to amazing places and you can capture some really interesting photos. So I set out to basically start shooting concerts and try to find my way on the tour. And I've toured with some big name artists, I've been on the road for six weeks at a time which is way too much and now I try to limit that to maybe three, four, five days at most with a band. Um, but what I love about shooting bands, well one, when you're on tour, most people have the total, they have a misconception that it's a, it's a non-stop party. And honestly, this is how tour works. You roll into a new city at, at like seven in the morning. You wake up, you load, you load into a venue, you get all the gear set up, you go to lunch. The band does sound check. You sit around, you have dinner. You sit around, the show starts, the show ends. You, un you, you pack up all the gear, you load it in the bus, you roll out at two in the morning, and then the next day you're in a new state. So it's not as glamorous as most people think, but what band photography offers me, or can offer a lot of people, is peop you have interesting subjects to photograph that are going to interesting locations. So it just affords me the opportunity to capture interesting people in those interesting locations that tell really, really cool photo stories. All right, well, uh, one of the things that people send in and ask questions on the askmark at adorama.com email is, how do I do concert photography, event photography, shooting people on a stage? Can you give us some tips? What, do you, what gear do you use? How do you meter? Do you use TTL? Do you use flashes? How do you personally do it? So one of the, the best things that I can say is you don't need the best gear in the world to shoot. You don't need the newest camera. Uh, you, you don't have to have that stuff. You just have to have an understanding of the lighting situation. Now with that said, I shoot all concerts in manual. I don't even look at the meter and I don't even worry about any of the aperture priority settings or spot metering because I, I like to have control of what's going on when I'm shooting. And you have to understand that if you're in aperture priority or you're in matrix metering and you see a reading that says one two thousandth of a second, uh, you know that that's most likely going to be too bright, it, actually that's going to give you too dark of an image because it's it's really not that bright in this situation. So I like to shoot in manual and, and change the settings based on the lights changing. So a lot of people say, how do you know when to change your shutter speed? Well, if the lights get dark, what do you do? You slow your shutter speed down. If it gets brighter, you bump your shutter speed back up. It's, it's as simple as just, just seeing the world around you, seeing the lighting situations and just reacting. It's the cause and effect of what's going on. If this is going to happen, then I need to do this to compensate for it. And if you're looking for a resource for that, on fronosphoto.com, if you sign up for the email list, you will get a free ebook for capturing light or capturing concerts in low light situations. Well, who can turn that down? That's awesome. Um, the other thing I love that you do is you talk to people for free on a regular basis on a thing called Spreecast. We did that uh, a week or two ago, I think, and it was a blast. Um, what's up with Spreecast and what are you doing there? Spreecast is pretty cool. I, I found, I always look for ways to connect with readers. The more that I can connect with the readers, the more questions I can answer, the more help that other people can get because uh, you know, what, what's great about Spreecast is that you can have up to four people on screen at one time interacting, but you could have thousands of people watching from around the world uh, that have the ability to turn on their camera and then join the conversation. So pretty much Mark and I would sit there, we'd have a conversation, just he and I on the screen. If somebody has a question about how do you shoot concerts, 
they can ask to get on camera, I can drag them onto the screen, and now we have a three-way conversation, as well as a chat that's going on, as well as popping up uh, different idea uh, links onto the screen. And what's even better is that it's fully recordable, it's instantly saved, so that anybody can go back and watch it and replay it later. So it's just a great way to interact with people uh, and help uh, basically answer all of the questions that they have. Well, that's awesome. and. Jared, unfortunately, we are out of time, but please, can you give us just a rundown of all the places people can see and interact with you? Give us your website addresses, and we'll throw them up on the screen, and that way people can connect with you and ask more questions. The best way to connect with me is on froknowsphoto.com. There you can, you can see how to submit questions, get involved with the Adoramapix rapid fire critique. Uh, you can also find your ways to Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, YouTube's a great place to subscribe because I'm putting up new videos almost every single day that, uh, that are fun, informative, interactive, uh, and then really, best way to connect, get onto YouTube and get onto Facebook and the Fronos Photo website. Awesome, thanks again, Jared, for joining us today. It's been a lot of fun. You're very welcome. You bet, Jared. Well, remember, if you want to see more How They Do That, you can zip over to the Adorama Learning Center where we've archived all of the How They Do That interviews, so you can check those out, as well as all of our digital photography one-on-one -on -one videos and product reviews and all kinds of great articles. It's all there, so why not zip over there, take a look, and learn more. This episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit Adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.